Aloha, spooky nerds, and welcome to Talking Strange, a paranormal pop culture show with the Den of Geek Network. I am your host, journalist, author, researcher of all things weird, Aaron Sagers. I also appear on the Travel Channel and Discovery Plus show, Paranormal Caught on Camera, and I am the host of the upcoming series, 28 Days Haunted, on Netflix that premieres October 21st, so please check that out. It's uh, Netflix's first paranormal reality show, so I'm quite excited for y'all to check it out. Now, let me talk to you about podcasts because I love podcasts. I think you guys know that based on how often I bring things up and the, I, I love talking to podcast producers, creators, and the creepier, the scarier, the better. And of course, you know, that sort of my intro to all of these things is Aloha Spooky Nerds. So uh, there's something to be said about the word spooky and spook that I quite love because a show I've been a fan of for quite some time now is Spooked. It's a story-driven podcast that features listener-submitted tales of weirdness. And they are weird. They get really weird. And they are now in the midst of Season 7 over at Spooked, which drops wherever you listen to podcasts. you got Spotify, you got Apple Podcasts, as well as on the Luminary app, where they also have bonus episodes now the man behind it all he has been with us before he's a grandson of a seer he was born into a family haunted by ghosts he was raised raised in an apocalyptic religious cult he studied in japan he as a teenager he witnessed his first exorcism he began the process of whispering back to the nighttime. He's a student of magic. He's traveled the world in search of the strange, the domestic, the divine. He is the host. He's the creator. He's the executive producer of Spooked. He is Mr. Glenn Washington. Glenn. Hey, hey, Aaron. Hey, thank you for joining me again. And, you know, it's it's a little bit of a process talking to you, Glenn Washington. And then there's the the narrator, the spooky narrator voice of yeah. spooked glenn washington right uh, <laughs> which i love i love and I, I, I don't think we've talked about this but how did you develop that voice that voice for spooked is it is it come from some sort of childhood character it's just the fact that you can drop your voice down to that level what is the what's the origin of of the spooked voice the origin of the spooked voice is really simple um you know, uh, I have kids, I have friends, uh, we go camping, and the only the after you set the fire, after the sun goes down, after after you've uh, put the marshmallows out and made the s'mores, around the campfire, it's always story time. And so whenever it's story time, you got to put on a story time voice. It's like, gather around, everybody ready, pour yourself a drink. Now it's going to tell a story. And it's that voice and it's actually that experience that is kind of the heart and soul of spook storytelling. I'm going to tell you, get back, get, sit back, get ready. I'm going to tell you a story now. It's story time. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, it's, it is. It's like having a drink. Um, you know, I occasionally partake in a cigar. I, it, so it feels like that's the, that's the voice that's accompanying it. There's the waft of like, smoke in the air a little bit of smokiness in my drink it's like jazz it's spooky jazz <laughs> it's that's that's what i like spooky about it. jazz i like that i think i'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna feel that from here <laughs> did i mean i know you're a radio guy uh, but have you ever done any um voice acting have you ever applied that voice to uh other performances sure um we do a lot um i'm the as you know the host of snap judgment sure um, but yeah, there's a, um, I try to act, you know, and um, sing, dance, or snap judgment live. But uh, I just think, and, and what's interesting is actually um, the, I, my voice, my persona changes oftentimes depending on the type of story I'm telling. And it was funny just the other day, I was actually in a coffee shop and I was writing a story. It was actually writing a, um, a poem. I start off oftentimes spooked 
with these kind of creepy poems. And I was imagining this ghoulish creature as I was as I was typing in my keyboard. And I, I didn't realize it so much. I was kind of getting into this character as I was trying to make these words right. And I was doing one of these numbers and I, 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 didn't, I didn't even understand what I was doing until this woman across from me kind of backs up, what is wrong with this guy? So I, and I had to put it down for a minute. Um, you do inhabit the the per, the voice, the mannerisms, the the character of of whom you're trying to portray. Um, I think I, in, in writing in general for me, um, I try to wear the skin of the person who whose voice I'm using, and um, that certainly happens with Spook. The I've I've really been thinking a lot lately about hosts when it comes to scary stories and and horror movies and and I was thinking a lot about sort of the the late night horror hosts whether it was Elvira or Sven Gulli or you know there's a lot of them out there and uh, did you have any you grew up in D D Detroit area right um, yeah did you have any of those who or I know you did and I forget who it was. No, 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 no. I was um, I was raised in an apocalyptic end of days right. cult, and we were not allowed to watch um, television, especially anything that had anything to do with demons and ghosts and ghouls and such of that nature. I don't know so much of the all the pop culture of my childhood. I have no idea what was right. Going on. I, and I knew that about your upbringing, but I, you know, I, I guess that that makes sense that you wouldn't have had access to the TV. Well, well, certainly, you know, that like even throughout today, there's, you know, we've had uh, across generations, Crypt Keeper on Tales from the Crypt, and we've had these other kind of characters. You could so easily just do this show with just a flat narration and and not even you. I mean, you could be someone else that launches right into the story straight away. What is the importance of having the host, having the the spooked version of Glenn introducing, setting the tone for what we're about to hear? I think you said it, setting the tone. Um, look, I have had a few experiences that I can't explain. I don't know what that was, who that was supposed to be. I don't understand them. And that's really the energy behind Spook in the first place. But we're on episode 120. If someone had 120 different experiences like this, I might be a little skeptical of myself. I don't have that. What I do try to do is say, this is what happened to me um, I'm not saying I saw anything crazy. I'm saying this is um, the world itself, your world, my world. There's mysteries in it. And um, I don't have to see a demon coming out of the, the bathtub in order to say, I don't get everything that's going on in this world. Most of my stories that I start off with in the beginning of the show are not supernatural, but they are setting the tone, the mood. The what's going on? I, I, I put, try to put someone in my head. Oftentimes, as a child, a child, um, my childhood, a lot of it was spent wandering by myself in the Michigan woods, um, and a lot of the stories come from there. I, I'm trying to, oftentimes, um, you know, we have a lot of people who, on various aspects of, of let's say, the belief system, listen to spooked. Um, some people who are really into um, ghosts and ghoulies and they believe and they've seen their, that's part of their world. And some people who think that's complete and utter nonsense. What I want is to introduce you to a world where the person, you, you trust the person that is speaking on our show. At least you trust them enough to think, they're not lying to me. They're not, they're not telling me a story. They're, they're telling me what this is what happened to me, believe it or don't. And if you don't believe it, that's one part. You listen to the thing and you know that this person's telling you their truth. I love it 
when you, the idea that we are complex people, we can hold two contradictory ideas into our head at the same time. And if I can get this person, this skeptic on here to just say, huh, then I feel like I've done my job. That's really what we're trying to do. This show, I don't do a lot of jump cuts. I, there's, not, there's not anybody running around with a knife. Um, in a lot of ways, the show is about wonder and trying to explore those things that we don't understand. A lot of it is spooky, but more than that, I'll say this. Um, we don't have a space oftentimes where in, the, in our world where we can talk about the big questions. And the big questions are, where am I going to go when I die? Where's Granny? Um, boy, I love that dog. I hope I get to see him again. Will I? Um, I love this person and they're gone. Will we ever be reunited again? These are the big questions that we work hard in our culture never to speak of, never ever to discuss, never ever to actually have honest discussions about. And the way for some reason, at least in our culture, the way that you oftentimes will get at those stories are through people telling ghost stories. I don't know what it is that unlocks us to say what we really think in that sense, in that situation, but it's true that I, I don't really care if like granny saw a ghost in the closet. That's not really what we're about. I want to know what this meant to you. What did your experience, your, our monsters are born out of something. Our monsters come from somewhere. Um, very, very rarely do you have someone have a supernatural experience that isn't connected to something going on in their life. What is it? And what did this experience answer? Or what did it change in your outlook? People marry. They move. They decide to go to school, they decide to drop out. They make huge life decisions based upon these supernatural experiences that oftentimes we don't talk about. I want to talk about them. I want to talk about what made you do this, why you're, why you're here. And, and, and I think it gives license to other people to talk about the stories that animate them. I know it does. Because so many people write us and tell us, you know, something happened to me. I, I most certainly agree with everything you said. I, I think from my experience, when I when I communicate with people, whether it's doing a talk um, in front of a, an audience or doing an interview or whatever, I find that a lot of times we are obviously in a divisive world, a divisive culture, and that sometimes extends to these ideas of the beyond or what's out there because well first off some people like to place rules to, to, on, on the unexplainable and then also a lot of times it seems like you're either in the category of belief almost dogmatic belief or total cynicism non-belief and i find that most people exist in a a big scope a spectrum in between of yeah Something might be out there. Something creepy might be out there. There's stuff out there I can't explain, but also there's a lot of bad wiring and leaky plumbing in the world. Um, but if you give people a chance to kind of exist in that middle and be open-minded, it seems like they're willing to kind of dip their toe into that, that pool, into that pool of weirdness. Would you agree? I would totally agree with that. Um, and I, I even go further. Um, we're having a world, at least in the in the um, in the North America, where people are becoming increasingly secular, and in that they they say that this I don't I'm not religious. Maybe I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Um, the 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 explanations for a lot of phenomena were oftentimes based in religion, and now people are looking for maybe broader or other ways to explain some of the things that they experience. 
that don't necessarily have a religious basis to them. And, um, and that's either, that could either challenge someone who has a very um, rigid understanding of their re religiosity or it can free them when they, you don't have to, in order to, to, to talk openly about your experience, it doesn't mean that you have to first accept A, B, C, and D first. You can just say, this is what happened to me. I, 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 again, I agree with that. And I think that with that kind of secular movement, it's, it's expanding the ideas of what's out there I, with that. You know, you were raised in a very strict religious upbringing, a, a cult, an apocalyptic cult, a cult. I was raised Catholic and it wasn't necessarily hellfire brimstone, but there was it was still Catholicism. So there's a lot of good and bad. There's there's the light in the dark, um, heaven, hell. And I I wonder if you think based on the stories and based on your travels and the people you've talked to. If people have more, if people have a growing appreciation for the nuance of the grayness of phenomena, and and I think that extends to even um, you know the some of the some of the recent uh, episodes that that you've had, like the Chinique, you know, it's they could be fairly mundane elemental spirits or entities in the forest protectors of of nature but they can also really mess you up and do a number on you if you cross them it, it, do you find in your stories that that's the case that, that people are kind of appreciating more appreciating more the nuance the gray not good not always good not always bad something that can be both or in between i i think what people appreciate more than anything is that I'm not trying to come up with any answers. I don't know. And I say this oftentimes in the show. Um, I, I, I don't have any um, belief system to sell you. I don't, you know, uh, you don't have to send me your tithes and offerings. I don't know, but this is what seems to be going on over here. And um, I think that that gives people freedom to, like you said, have a nuanced view about things. Um, when I guess that that the lack of dogmatism are that we kind of approach this subject with, um, just it's funny because you find that the world in general is is becoming more and more dogmatic, and everyone's going into their camps, and you know even zip codes and addresses, people are. You live over there, and we are, you're not our people, and, and our, our people are over there, and you're over there. Not just supernatural storytelling, but storytelling in general is a way that people put down their dukes. Um, there's something really magical about saying, this is what happened to me. And, and, and understand, look, you know, do what you want with this story. I'm just telling you, this is this is how it went down when I was walking down the street this one day. Da, 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 da. And honestly, and it's more, it's more than just, you know, for me, honestly, I think that we have to start telling and listening to each other's stories. We it's the only way we have for getting in someone else's skin. There is no, we don't have any other tools for this. It's the only real tool that we have for empathy. And it seems like our empathy engine is broken. And unless we fix it by being able to understand what it is to walk in someone else's shoes, then I think we're, we're doomed. And that's kind of the point of the storytelling is to let you see the world through someone else's eyes. It's also, it's a way of seeing the connective tissue across cultures, I think, because when you are using, again, the referencing the, the Chinique episode that was the, um, I think, first episode of season seven, 
you know, automatically when I'm listening to this strange story and it was very well done and it comes from a different part of the world, um, comes from Oaxaca. Right. And, but I'm listening to that and I'm like, Oh, you know, I've heard of the Chinique but I'm also like, Oh, that sounds like a leprechaun or a duende or an elf, you know? And it's, it's like, okay, well, it's not just, here's the Brown people over here telling their story. It's, this is what binds us to every other part of the world. Uh, which it really makes me excited because I'm like, if you remove the names, the phenomena seems to be repeating all over the place. Um, the, the, I mean, first off, is that pretty exciting for you when you see that kind of overlap? It's I love it. I love seeing what you know what we might call the fae or the fairy or the small folk. Um, other people have other names for them. They have other traditions around them, and they. But the, I love seeing the similarities with that. But I also love the differences mm -hmm. um, that who we think of as being, say, neutral or even good, another culture might see them as being wicked or dangerous. And, um, and we're talking about things that might look the same, but might not even be the same. We are a plastic species, and, but we do seem to have some of these common touchstones and exploring the world through um, not just fable, through, but through fears and through the people's experiences with the, uh, with the paranormal. Oh, I love, I love it. I love the look, the light that goes into someone's eyes when they talk about when they were eight years old and when they were going through the woods and what they saw. I love that, um, that, that feeling of presence and reality when they say who they saw sitting at the foot of their bed. I love that. It, it, it is universal. Um, but man, we have such an explosions of different belief systems that we attach to those things that we see. Um, when, if you see a character running through the woods a tiny character and you see that character in Kenya or you see that character in Ireland, you see that character in Oaxaca or you see that character in New Mexico, that same character is going to mean very, very different things to you. And I want to hear about those as well. Yeah. As the, as the mission of spook changed at all over the course of the seasons. Um, I mean, it still seems very, very much, following the same, um, you know, story kind of mechanism, but internally has, has it changed at all? We want to have a good time. We want to make sure people enjoy their trip through this dark world. But, um, because I think, I think because we're not really trying to convince anyone of anything and we get to catalog a lot of different types of experiences. A lot of our stories come from all over the globe. We've become a lot more deliberate. Um, we know that we're building a real repository of stories that people might not know anything about. And we're taking this a lot more seriously than we might have when we first started. And we're taking it seriously for a lot of reasons, but one of them is that um, a lot of story, a lot of people and a lot of communities, they don't want to have the stories of their environs or their community or their culture toyed with. They want, if they're going to share it, they want to make sure that the person or the organization they're sharing it with is going to be respectful from whence the stories come from, the people the story come from, the community and the traditions they come from. And we're, we want to be that group. And that means that we have to work harder to respect the cultures from what the stories come. 
um, if I mess up or if I'm disrespectful or dismissive of one person's story, then why would the next person go through the process of sharing their story with me or with my group, with our people? And our producers, I think, are so cognizant of this. Um, they're cognizant that uh, we are guests oftentimes in someone else's home. And there's nothing more giving, more personal. Um, uh, you're, you're taking the heart of someone when someone shares a story that's deeply personal to them. And boy, we want to be respectful of that. Yeah. I, and, you know, I... It's like I, you know, I work on the I've talked about the paranormal and spooky stuff for a long time. And, and in recent years, that's included a lot of TV stuff. And I'll tell you what, there's plenty of white bearded dudes on TV talking about the paranormal. And unfortunately, not a lot of people of color and and not a lot of communities of color whose stories are being represented. And it's something that I definitely think is necessary and important. But also, there is a reasonable suspicion of if someone goes into those communities and says, hey, tell me those stories. It's traditionally those stories have been misrepresented. They've been mishandled. And then the worst stereotypes tend to be the ones that are promoted and exacerbated. And then um, and then suddenly it seems like those communities kind of contract and don't want to talk about these tales. I, I mean, I guess that's a statement. That's not so much a question, but it I, animates I mean, everything. Um, it animates everything that we do. We, um, we're not, we're not walking into a vacuum when we try to get these stories. We're talking to communities that have oftentimes felt burnt and felt exploited. And I want to be able, the only way I can tell them that I'm going to be respectful and, and serious and appropriate with their stories to say, look what we've done already. Here are the people we've spoken to. Here are the, here are the stories that we told and here's how we told them. Um, yeah, we're fighting upstream. And um, almost every, every time um, we're good, we have to first establish a trust before we get anywhere near someone being willing to share their story with us. And I and I I just think that you know you do that what you we've always you know been really, we want the, it's a kind of the the way of the world for our organization snap we always want to be respectful but now we're noticing in a different way um, that these stories have a different type of power they're a different type of treasure and we want to be. we want to be the organization that can really serve as a repository of these stories. I, I just don't know how else to put it. We're, I am so proud of the team that speaks to people, the team that you know, it's not all about um, scary stories. you got to talk, you got to have some food first. You might have to have some, you know, what, what are you drinking? What are you eating? What's the kids' names? What's going on? We need to understand the communities first before we can um, try to talk about the stories that come from that community and the people that work on the show. I, I just, I can't, I really just can't um, praise them enough for that type of um, vision. And I think, and, and, and it's gonna, it just, it just allows us to go deeper and deeper and deeper. The more serious we are about these communities, the more serious we are about um, this sort of, what we're really doing. I wouldn't have to, I would not necessarily have said when we first started out that this show what we're, is a lot of cultural excavation and cu on cultural anthropology. I would not necessarily have said that, but I know that it's integral to everything everything that we do now. Well, and I I think that I've gotten a sense of of you a little bit as a person, but also by listening to the show that it's clearly not just a 
um, churn and burn process with your with your uh, interview subjects, your your uh, listeners and the people whose stories you tell. I and and because Spooked was was born out of I guess the the dark of night um, <laughs> of snap judgment um, and spun off from that. Has there been a story, a, a spook story where you have pursued it a little bit? You have broken the bread. You have talked to someone from a community and then it's got a it's a real meaty story. But then it just doesn't come to fruition because ultimately they say, you know what? No, I, I just I don't want to go there after all. Oh, it happens all the time. Um, and oftentimes maybe they'll change their mind later on. We don't I, I'm not there to to take something from someone that they don't want to give. Um, and, and two, um, we, we oftentimes are looking for a phenomenon that we haven't been able to nail down properly. We did a, a story um, last season on skinwalkers and um, we didn't, that took three or four years before we were able to find someone who wanted to speak to us about it and trusted us enough to tell that story. Um, yeah, it just, we, we, we have to have the active participation of the person involved in our story. I can't, this is, I'm not going to sneak up on you with a microphone and I'm not going to, I'm not going to um, creep out the back door with it, with something. That's just not how we're going to do it. It's just not going to work. Um, so yeah, so do, do we stop stories? Um, we do all the time. And oftentimes again, too, a lot of the reason we, we do want, you know, we want to take people for a ride. We want to have fun. We want to have a good time. We want to, we want them to see a different part of the world, but a lot of the stories that are paranormal are oftentimes born of trauma. And maybe a lot of times the reason why we might back away from the story is that that trauma has not been properly processed yet. I don't necessarily think like maybe we're, you are the person telling the story is ready to share this with someone else yet. They need to do some stuff with themselves or with the people who they care about and not some producer with a microphone. And we, you know, we need to back off. We need to be willing to say, oh, it's a great story, but I can't do this right now. Yeah. I mean, storytelling, telling, telling a story, telling your story can be a form of therapy. So if you're still in the baby steps, the beginning part of that, you might not be, through that therapy enough um, for that story to be told truly the, yeah, I, I wanted to talk to you about something that last time we chatted, we ended up having a conversation a little bit off air and off air. Like I'm talking like this is actually old traditional, right? Old habits, you know? Uh, but the, the, the title of the show is spooked itself. It's a tricky one because I love the word spooky, but it also has this problematic history. We have it uh, a 19th century Dutch word for specter, and then it takes on this other connotation in World War II, a word for a spy, but also a slur for a black person. And then and then kind of goes back and forth. Everything from Spook Central and Ghostbusters to spooky season to the other. Se so. So where do we land on this from your perspective and also why make, frankly, a pretty bold decision to say, all right, we're, we're owning it. We're calling the, calling the show spooked. Yeah. Um, my um, co-executive producer, Mark Ristich, who is a white guy, he was dead set against calling this show spooked. No freaking way are we going to do that um and i just kept pushing back on them um because just like i i how there's been um 
people have repurposed the N word um, to take it one um, a different way than I think uh, uh, something different from the slur. I felt like here's an opportunity to do that was a, a completely different um, piece of the vocabulary. Um, a black dude doing spooked. Honestly, I more than anything, it was funny to me. As something I wanted to lean into, and I figured like I totally hear what Mark was saying. I totally hear what you're saying, and I agree with them. Mark and I fight all the time, but I, I'm mean, gonna I say fight. We we discuss um, things um, widely all the time. But this is like, no, let's go on ahead and do it. Um, I want to own this. I want, I want this to come from a cultural perspective that lets me let let's you you mentioned before that there's a lot of white dudes with gray with uh, beards on Netflix. I want to be very very deliberate that this was not that show. That every time that there's a host on a show, they're going to bring a set of certain cultural expectations to the storytelling. I wanted to kind of almost tongue in cheek allude to what mine were. Um, I'm definitely coming with a point of view. And my point of view is really animated by my racial experience in the United States. Um, good for good or bad or whatever. And I wanted to own that really upfront in the whole construction of the show. Ever think about doing Spooked uh, as a TV show? Yes. <laughs> that's, all, that's all I can say about that. Um, we, <laughs> we, we're, we're working on it. Stay tuned. You better give me a call on that. I want to be involved. <laughs> but um, the do you have any any interest in internet lore or sort of? Well, actually, instead of reframing it as internet lore, let me rephrase this as: Have you noticed a shift in some of the stories that you might be receiving that are very modern, twenty first century modern stories, and that could be a result of the ghosts in the machine? Or it could be a result of a global pandemic. It could be take it, take it from there. 21st century tales. I love everything. Um, if we find a good one, we would absolutely put it on spooked. If it if it elucidates an area that we don't know anything about, I'm all for it. Um, but I I will say this. Um you've what we're uh, the stories that oftentimes have the biggest resonance are the stories that have the biggest, almost historical association. And um, you're looking at these fault lines of race and class and culture, of gender. Um, these, um, how how do I say it? The The specters that pop up, these things that are still here, these these uh, these beings, let's say, or this energy, oftentimes comes from a particular type of experience, and that's why you have it around. You know, they say um, uh, a war sites end up being a nice a, a site where you have a certain type of activity. Um, I mean, the you have like spiritualism that was born out of the aftermath of the Civil War, and then the another wave of spiritualism after World War One, and then I think, arguably, the fascination in re paranormal reality TV shows was a result of nine eleven, and then now we have this happening currently. Actually, uh, trauma makes ghosts, um, and um, and. The like yes, you have such a thing as uh, there's certainly a trauma associated with our modern world, but um, the 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 fault lines of our society right now are race, class, gender, sexuality. These are very old fault lines. 
um, the, and and you have a lot of energy, a lot of horror. Uh, when I say horror, I don't mean in a in a comic book or a movie situation. I mean horror associated with these things, with war. Um, and all I can say is that's where the monsters come from. And sure, you know, you want to do some modern stuff, great. But are you going to, over time, have the storytelling baggage that these other things have? I, I would doubt it. Any fo any any phenomena that you're just kind of antsy to get presented to you in story form? I mean, again, you you spent a lot of time in Japan, and I know you have had some. Uh, I remember last season. I think you had a, a story that came out of Japan. If I or maybe that was uh, shoot, maybe that was Korea. But um, any any phenomena lore that yeah, you're antsy to kind of sink your teeth into. Yeah. I really am interested in the lore of North Africa. I would like to have, a, you know, we, we think of the genie as being um, something that you rub a lamp and, um, and someone comes out and gives you three wishes. Um, that is very, very different than the, how the people who, who live in a land of gin would describe that phenomenon and describe that type of person. And that's what it is. I would love to, I'd love for us to embed enough in North Africa to be able to come up with some stories that explore the, the lore there. Yeah, you're, you're talking my language. I'm so fascinated about that because it's also so tied in with the Islamic faith and, and this idea, again, sort of this, this entity that might just be existing and living its own life sort of slightly askew from our world or out of view. But then if you also kind of rub up against the wrong one, then you're inviting all sorts of uh, bad stuff. So I, I trust me, I, I, I most certainly want to hear that story on Spooked as well. It is a fascinating, fascinating uh, phenomena. And before I let you go, just I mean, again, like I, I, I really enjoy talking with you because you do have such a diverse background from your upbringing to your education and your career. Have what I mean, are you actually is there anything that you're that's that that is spooky to you that freaks you out? Any even low level superstition? What, what what's kind of going on inside of you? Oh, everything. Everything freaks me out. Everything does. In fact, you know, it was funny. I, I um, just I have a, a long term from friends. I do a lot of chatting with um, on the Internet there on a on a text thread. And they just went ahead and renamed the, the text thread. Um, All UFOs are nothing but UFOs just because I kept babbling so much. And you just saw was it a couple weeks ago in the Ukraine where. Uh, they started repurposing astronomical instruments and they started seeing all of these um, these objects flying around that they didn't know were there. And some people were saying, well, of course they're there. They're because they're in the middle of a war. Those are weapons. And it, but they don't seem to have any of these weapon signatures. What are they? What, why are we seeing them when we as soon as you point these um, telescopes at the sky in a different way? What is going on? And um, it's I just I just found it fascinating that for a lot of if I were like say from another planet I would probably want to know what are we doing over there myself I might want to get a closer look in a different way I don't know I just think it's I have I have no no not no special knowledge no special understanding I just think it's crazy interesting and um, I would love a story that allowed us to explore that phenomenon from a, um, a first person perspective, someone who had really seen it. We don't have that story yet, but I would like to get it. If there's somebody out there who would like to tell me this story, I would love to have it. I'm I mean, I, I'm with you. I mean, at this point, 
well, you know, I, I talk about all the folklore and everything, but man, at this point, man, like UFO stuff, I'm like, I don't even know if it's really paranormal anymore, guys. Like, I think it's just kind of out there. <laughs> right. And all that, all the, I, the, there's just so much real mystery. I think it's interesting now as well. Again, forget like this, the paranormal stuff. When you, we're, um, when you have a bunch of areas right now are being revealed for the first time in thousands of years because of um, the, the impact of climate change. And we're seeing um, tools, we're seeing um, uh, all sorts of things that are left behind from civilizations that we didn't really know a whole lot about. The idea that you had all of these these um, uh, civilizations in the Americas before Columbus that are completely wiped out um, that we don't really know a whole lot about. We don't know, we know next to nothing about. Um, I, I want to explore the relationship between those communities and us today. What did they leave behind? This is what we're oftentimes talking about is what is the, is there some sort of energy residue, resonance, something that is left behind that we can point to that someone's had an experience with? I, I just, I, at the end of the day, I think the world is made out of wonder and I want to dig into it. I, we can't, we're never, I don't feel like we're ever going to run out of stories. Um, I feel like we're just we're very we're just beginning to to strike the surface on some of these things. Um, I, and I said again, I, I just keep saying this, I don't have to have all I got to do is be curious. I don't have to have an answer about anything. I want to find out what happened to you. What did you see? What did you experience? Why did you experience it? And um, and you know the best way, oftentimes, to live a lot of this stuff, a lot live a lot of trauma, is to do it vicariously i don't want to travel myself i want to live it through some someone else's experience yeah yeah i mean i probably would go on board of the spaceship but um hey if you if you find one let me know come get me <laughs> all right well final question since we're in the midst of season seven there's already uh you're, you're gonna go into production for eight uh momentarily but what can you tease out for Season seven, any stories that you're particularly excited for folks to uh, to listen to? Yeah, this is a season of, I've mentioned this before, but this is a season of monsters. This is a season where we get to look at some creatures um, that are not supposed to be there. Creatures that um, we thought were only imaginary and creatures that um, behave in ways where you, that you do not expect. Um, just because something might look scary doesn't mean that it has an evil intent. And I can't wait for people to hear the stories in this season. Season of monsters. I love it. And hey, I, my friend, I'm wearing a Mothman hat. So uh, I love the hat. I love the hat. I really do. <laughs> thank you. I, the weirder, the better, my friend. I, I'm so stoked to, to hear what you have in store this season. Well, <laughs> um, the man is glenn washington the show is spooked you can check out the newest episodes as they are released on fridays on spotify and apple pod apple podcast you can apple also podcast. listen on luminary and by downloading the luminary app where there is additional content and bonus episodes glenn thank you so much my friend for joining me it is just such a just such a treat talking to you i just i love it i, I, I love it <laughs> Thank you for having me, Aaron. I really appreciate it. Thank you.